I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people on whose land this video is being made, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Hi, I'm Bruce Derby, and I'm a Deputy Principal at Masnog College in Les Murdy, and I've been teaching English and literature for 18 years. I have a particular interest in persuasive and interpretive writing because I feel they offer students such enormous opportunities to show off their skills and to write about things that they genuinely care about. There are two learning intentions for this video. The first is to be able to identify the features of persuasive and interpretive texts. And the second is to be able to craft language for the purposes of these texts. Now I'd like to start with a time warp back to the 2018 ATAR English paper. There's nothing wrong with the 2019 paper. I'd just like to focus on the 2018 because it offered an interesting range of opportunities. In this paper, there were three questions that offered students the opportunity to compose persuasive and interpretive texts. The first of these was question 10, which reads, I don't think you quite understand the ramifications of this decision. Incorporate this statement into a persuasive text for a resistant audience. In question 11, students were directed to compose an interpretive text which read, Compose an interpretive text to represent an encounter with a person who taught you something about yourself. While the previous two questions were explicitly persuasive and interpretive, question 14 gave students scope to produce an interesting interpretive text depending on how they worked with the image. Now this question didn't specify a genre, but I really think this one gives some really interesting opportunities. And I'll be talking through that a little bit later in this video. So now it's important to understand what persuasive and interpretive texts are. And so persuasive texts are texts whose primary purpose is to put forward a point of view and persuade a reader, viewer or listener. They form a significant part of modern communication in both print and digital environments. They include advertising, debates, arguments, discussions, polemics, and essays and articles. Now I want to draw your attention to the idea that what distinguishes persuasive writing is its purpose and its primary purpose is to put forward a point of view and persuade a viewer or listener. So the key here is that we're trying to change the way our audiences think, feel or act. Interpretive writing is quite different. And the syllabus tells us that the interpretive texts are those whose primary purpose is to explain and interpret personalities, events, ideas, representations or concepts. And these include autobiography, biography, media, feature articles, uh, documentary film and other non-fiction texts. There's a focus on interpretive rather than informative texts in the senior years of schooling. So the key difference here is that Interpretive texts had the purpose to explain and interpret personalities and events as well as ideas, representations and concepts. So another way of thinking about the difference between interpretive and persuasive texts is this simplistic way of thinking about it. One way is to think of interpretive texts in terms of, I have come to understand that. Persuasive writing is when you say to your audience, you need to understand that. One is a little bit more reflective and one is more persuasive. So what do we make of this? The 2018 examiner's report made a curious statement about the whole composing section of the exam that says that students should see this section as a thinking section and one that measures creativity and critical thinking from question choice to genre to audience to topic. So how can we apply this in a practical sense to our preparation for exams? I'd like you to think about the moment this November when you're about to open up your exam paper and you'll see a range of questions in there. You'll be looking at the comprehending section and you'll find two texts that don't look too bad. You look through the responding section and you'll see at least two questions that you could write something really cool about in relation to the text you've studied. And then you turn to the composing section and you'll see a couple of questions that you definitely don't want to do and you'll see a question that has a bit of a curveball in it and then you realize that you're completely stuck. What I want to do now is to be able to show you some strategies that will prevent you from falling into a hole at the start of that exam. 
So let's go back to the exam we were looking at before. Before we get into decoding questions, there's a key point I want to emphasize, and that's that you need to understand your enemy, the examiner. I want to promise you that examiners want to do two things in this section. They want an exam that every student who is engaged thoroughly with the course can approach to demonstrate their learning. Second, they want their exam to provide opportunities for those students who have the deepest understanding of the course to be able to shine and to show off their understandings. These exams are not designed to trip students up, they're designed to provide you with opportunities. And for that reason, each question has discriminators in the wording. The discriminators are those specific instructions that show when a student has engaged with the whole question. So now we're going to approach these three questions identified before in light of the discriminators that are in them. So let's look at question 10. I don't think you, I don't think you quite understand the ramifications of this decision. Incorporate this statement into a persuasive text for a resistant audience. The first discriminator you incorporate is, this, is the sentence itself, the phrase at the top, and you need to give that a bit of thought. A lot of students will conveniently make it their first or last sentence without really engaging with it. So it's important to be thoughtful about that before you start writing. There are two more key elements in this question. The most obvious is that the text you compose needs to be persuasive, meaning that its purpose is to persuade an audience to change their thoughts or their attitudes or their behaviours. The real key discriminator of this question is at the end. And that is that it is for a resistant audience. So that means you need to think of a context for your writing and an audience that doesn't already share your position. I'll talk a little later on what it means to reach out to a resistant audience. In question 11, you're asked to compose an interpretive text to represent an encounter with a person who taught you something about yourself. So the key discriminators here are about composing an interpretive text. So you need to make sure that your text is about making meaning, making sense of a person, event, or representation. What students might find tricky in the, with this question is the key discriminator, and this is about an encounter with the person who taught you something about yourself. This discriminator would likely be the thoughtfulness with which students engage with this idea about learning about oneself. And what I hope uh, to help you with in the second half of this video is an approach to interpretive text that can simplify the thinking process and the approach to structure of an interpretive text. Now, when it comes to the next question, I really do love this one. There's so much you could do with it, but there's also a key trap in this. The key discriminator in this question is to make clear for your audience what the form of your writing is. So you need to understand the features of your genre in order to make it clear to your reader what kind of text they're reading. The key discriminator about revealing a part of this person's history requires students to create a plausible story or event that one could see in the representation we see in the image. Many students would write narratives, although I think that this question screams interpretive text because it's about interpreting the story of the person we see in the image. So now we've seen some of the key question types that you could encounter in an exam and you've seen how you can think your way through the discriminators and the questions. What we need to do now is to really understand these two forms of writing, persuasive and interpretive writing. Now I want to liberate you from a misapprehension that many students have about persuasive writing. For many students, persuasive writing is where they use statistics, rhetorical questions, lists, parallelism and so on and so forth. Being able to shape at the sentence level of a persuasive text is indeed important, but I think the persuasion is actually about the underlying principles. And so these principles of persuasion should be understood first, and we should know what's important for an audience in relation to an issue. We should then meet the audience where they are, and then we should appeal to their reason, emotion, or their relationship with you to move them to your position. There's nothing new here. In fact, the principles of persuasion that I'm going to talk about are over two and a half thousand years old with the Greek terms logos, pathos, ethos, and kairos. The first of these appeals is an appeal to logic and reason through cause and effect, 
if this then that statements, through facts and statistics, and any other appeal to the reason and rationality of your audience. A pathos appeal is an appeal to the emotions of the audience, from the worst of the audience's emotions to the best. Pathos appeals include appeals to fear of the other, sympathy, feelings of patriotism, nostalgia, as well as hope. For some arguments, it's important that the speaker has some credibility or authority on the topic. When the writer or the speaker use an ethos appeal, they're saying to the audience things like, trust me, I'm one of you, I'm an expert, or I'm famous. The last kind of appeal that I want to mention is kairos, which is an appeal to the timeliness of action. This type of appeal is telling the audience, now is the time, or don't miss the opportunity. Now, I can't reinforce enough that the key to persuasion is around these underlying principles. The current historical moment is one where these principles are the most important. Going back to one of the exam questions from 2018, it referred to a resistant audience. Persuasion is about shifting the attitudes, thoughts and actions of a resistant audience. So there are some clear traps that we can run into, and one of the biggest of these is to attack or insult your audience. No one was ever persuaded by being called an idiot. The key to effective persuasion is to have empathy, to put yourself into the shoes of your audience, no matter how much they might differ from you in their opinions, and to find common ground and bring them to your position. And with these principles of persuasion in mind, with a clear focus on persuasive appeals, I'd like to share some examples from fictional and real worlds. The first of these is of Robert Kennedy. Now in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot by a white gunman. A few hours later, presidential candidate Robert Kennedy stood in front of a mostly African-American audience to announce the news that they did not know. In the video you're about to see, I'd like you to consider how he reaches out to that audience and where they are at. And he does an interesting thing. You might not know from your history that Robert Kennedy was the brother of President John F. Kennedy, who was assassinated in 1963. And in this video, Robert Kennedy finds common ground with the audience and sharing in their grief from his own experience. Could you lower those signs, please? I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Oh, Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible. You can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in greater polarization. Black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with be filled with hatred and mistrust 
of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, my, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. And he once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. Feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past, but we will, and we will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness, and it's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life, and want justice for all human beings that abide in our land. With and what dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Thank you very much. Channel 10's The Project and its host Waleed Ali arguably owe their existence to Jon Stewart, who largely established the comedy news genre. The Daily Show, now hosted by Trevor Noah, was started by Jon Stewart, who has since dedicated his efforts to lobbying and supporting the men and women first responders from 9-11. The context for this is when the planes hit the Twin Towers in New York in 2001, Thousands of men and women, police, firefighters and other emergency workers rushed to the scene to save lives. Not long after, they started getting sick with unusual diseases and many have been dying. This extract is from John Stewart's testimony to Congress when he does exactly what I've just told you not to do. He attacks his audience. But I think his real audience is not the congressmen and women before him, but the general public who they serve. In this next extract from Stuart's testimony, we have examples of powerful sentence structures such as the first responders not having to choose whether to live or to have a place to live. Most notably, he invokes a pathos appeal by appealing to the patriotic duty of Congress and his Kairos appeal to the urgency of action that is required. I want to thank Mr. Collins and Mr. Naylor for putting this together, but uh, as I sit here today, I can't help but think what an incredible metaphor this room is for the entire process that getting health care and benefits for 9-11 first responders has come to. Behind me, a filled room of 9-11 first responders, and in front of me, a nearly empty Congress. Sick and dying, they brought themselves down here to speak to no one. It's shameful. It's an embarrassment to the country and it is a stain on this institution. 
and you should be ashamed of yourselves for those that aren't here, but you won't be. Because accountability doesn't appear to be something that occurs in this chamber. Now, I've got an outrageous idea for you, and that is that persuasive language is not only used in persuasive text. Now, I'm a bit biased, but I think that interpretive writing is the kind of writing that all students should gravitate towards. It's the genre you meet every day. We tell stories to each other all the time, some of them true, some of them not so true, and some of them you wish were true. In each of those stories is an interpretive text where you've taken an event from what you've done or what you've seen to make it meaningful to somebody else. When you tell stories to your friends and your family, you're not just telling them what happened, you're interpreting it in a way that will be meaningful to them. So when we write interpretive texts, we're writing about a complex issue or person or an event in a way that others will enjoy and find meaningful. We're making sense of complex issues or people or events in a way that make the reader care about them. And we're talking about something familiar from the world and getting the reader to see it in a new way. I want to introduce you to somebody that you may not have heard of, and that's Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell's made a career out of interpretive writing, and if you're into podcasts, I strongly recommend his Revisionist History podcast. And what I want to do here is to show an example from Gladwell's writing that you can steal like an artist. You can do a lot worse than to emulate an accomplished writer whose style is simple and adaptable to so many situations. This particular piece focuses on the 1993 Wimbledon final when Jana Novotna lost to Steffi Graf from a virtually unassailable position. Here, we see her being consoled by the Duchess of Kent during the awards ceremony. There was a moment in the third and deciding set of the 1993 Wimbledon final when Jana Novotna seemed invincible. She was leading 4-1 and serving at 40-30, meaning that she was one point from winning the game and just five points from the most coveted championship in tennis. She had just hit a backhand to her opponent, Steffi Graf, that skimmed the net and landed so abruptly on the far side of the court that Graf could only watch in flat-footed frustration. The stands at centre court were packed. The Duke and Duchess of Kent were in their customary place in the royal box. Novotna was in white, poised and confident, and her blonde hair held back with a headband. And then something happened. She served the ball straight into the net. She stopped and steadied herself for the second serve. The toss, the arch of the back, but this time it was worse. Her swing seemed half-hearted, all arm and no legs and torso. Double fault. On the next point, she was slow to react to a high shot by Graf and badly missed on a forehand volley. At game point, she hit an overhead straight into the net. Instead of 5-1, it was now 4-2. Graf to serve, an easy victory, 4-3. Novotna to serve. She wasn't tossing the ball high enough. Her head was down. Her movements had slowed markedly. She double faulted once, twice, three times. Pulled wide by Graf forehand, Novotna inexplicably hit a low, flat shot directly at Graf, instead of a high cross-court forehand that would have given her time to get back into position. 4-4. Four, four. Did she suddenly realise how terrifyingly close she was to victory? Did she remember that she had never won a major tournament before? Did she look across the net and see Steffi Graf? Steffi Graf! the greatest player of her generation? Human beings sometimes falter under pressure. Pilots crash and divers drown. Under the glare of competition, basketball players cannot find the basket and golfers cannot find the pin. When that happens, we say variously that people have panicked or to use the sports colloquialism, choked. But what do those words mean? Both are pejoratives. To choke or to panic is considered to be as bad as to quit. But are all forms of failure equal? And what do the forms in which we fail say about who we are and how we think? We live in an age obsessed with success, with documenting the myriad ways by which talented people overcome challenges and obstacles. There is as much to be learned, though, from documenting the myriad ways in which talented people 
sometimes fail. Gladwell's writing uses the techniques of storytelling. We have the setting of Wimbledon in 1993. We have a protagonist, Jana Novotna. We have an antagonist, Steffi Graf. We have an anticlimactic ending. Novotna chokes and eventually loses. He also uses the features of persuasive language. He has rhetorical questions, parallelism, and varied sentence lengths. So what makes this an interpretive text? Well, the writing takes an event and interprets it, making it a case study in how we understand the complex idea of how we manage failure. So let's look at the pattern here, which is one that we can steal and adapt. First, plunge into a story that will serve as a case study for your interpretive writing. Invest in the techniques of narrative. Then pivot to an interpretation of the story in terms of the theme, usually found in your title. Enlist the sentence level techniques of persuasion. And finally, return to the original story, only this time with some new details that encapsulate your text. It could be from the original moment or years later. The structure is so incredibly adaptable to so many different kinds of writing. Additionally, it allows you to show off your skills in doing all the things of narrative text, as well as all of the things of persuasive text, which can only translate into a positive response from your markers. Now, I'd like to show you an example of a student's piece of writing who used elements of this style. The following is a sample of a student work by a young man named Kofi Chow. Now, this work has not been edited, so it will have errors and elements where the writing could benefit from editing. It was completed under exam conditions, and I want you to watch for his playfulness with language, his use of an amusing set of anecdotes to make a serious point about family, and the structural shifts and links back to the beginning. So let's get started with this student's piece of writing. The kind of writing that the student has employed is an open letter. Dear outdoorsy dad, I get it. I really do. You only want what's best for me and for whatever reason you think this is. I understand you never got to do this sort of thing growing up. You never had a tent or a caravan or a sleeping bag. But you know what else you never had? A laptop, internet, hollow night. You wanted me to experience what you never could every single holiday. But the thing is, I've experienced fishing all night. I've experienced eating maybe cooked meat over an open flame and have experienced trying to sleep under the sound of extremely heavy rain and gushes of extremely strong wind under the shelter of a not extremely sturdy tent. But guess what? I didn't actually enjoy it. And every time you guilt and promise your way into me going, I just want some father-son time. And there won't be a storm this time, promise. Yeah, well, guess what? Despite your genuine belief, there are other ways to have father-son time. I know, it's shocking. You may even find it almost unbelievable. In fact, you must find it unbelievable because here we are again in the middle of nowhere with an extremely present storm somewhat contradicting your promise, literally holding our two by two metre tent to the ground. Oh, don't worry, this time there won't be a storm or rain, just a nice grassy part of the woods. And right you are. No rain, no storm, just grass and sticks. Actually quite peaceful, enjoyable even. Until you add your special twist on the holiday, staying up all night listening for wild animal noises. So here we are, listening to crickets and owls and wolves. Wait, what? Wolves? Oh, not a problem. You brought an axe. An axe? Are you daft? If you warned me of wolves, I would literally never come here unless you brought a minigun and a steel-plated 50-metre high fort, not an axe and half kind of working tent. No wolves this time. No large mammals at all. This time, going canoeing on a marsh. yippity do. And as if that wasn't pleasant enough, it comes with the thrill of alligators. Alligators? Alligators? The not mammal, but mostly certainly large, eating machine with jaws bigger than my arms. But it's okay because this time we're staying in a cabin. Thank God. At least I can stay in the safety of something that doesn't have an 80% chance of flying away under the very weight of my breathing. Go out and get some firewood. What? Do you want me dead? Is that the objective here? 
You think not, because I am sprinting to find firewood and sprinting back to the cabin before I find myself being devoured by one of the few man-eating lizards left to roam the earth. And you know, when I look back at my life, I really want to hate you. I really want to hate you for every time you took away my laptop, every time you forced me to eat something that was more than likely edible, and every time we encounter something that saw me as more than likely edible. But I don't. Every time I look back on our life-risking holidays, I can't remember being miserable or depressed. In fact, it may have been the only time I wasn't. When I look back every time we challenged each other to see who would give up and let go of the tent first, every time we pondered what would happen if a grizzly bear came across a hungry pack of wolves while listening to howling in front of a campfire, every time I got the thrill of escaping death at the hands of a hundred tooth armoured monstrosity, even though I didn't ever actually see an alligator, I don't hate you. I love you more. I'd hate you every time you'd ask me if I wanted to go on a holiday trip. But whenever I did, I never regretted it. And when I didn't, I'd spend my two weeks inside playing a game about bugs with swords. I'd hate myself, not just because I managed to spend over 50 hours of my life on a laptop or because I had sudden revelations about when I die and my life flashes before my eyes. The majority of it will be staring at a screen because I know I missed out. I missed out on another adventure with you. I missed out on another tale of woe to tell my kids. I missed out on another holiday of father-son time. Because yeah, there are other ways to have father-son time. But not when I had the option of some warrior bug time with my laptop. So thanks for being annoying every single holiday. So what was it that I found appealing about this piece of writing? The first thing is its playful use of language. We have irregular grammatical structures every single holiday. We have creative compound words, half kind of working tent, hundred tooth armored monstrosity. We also have the attention to audience. While the audience directs to a particular father, the genre and language widen the audience to a broader group of people. Finally, the structure is effective because there's a clear shift from the beginning to the middle and a return at the end. So what are the takeaways from what I've been saying so far? Well, the first is that when we think about the difference between persuasive and interpretive texts, we're talking about purpose, genre and audience. We looked at the decoding of questions where we need to carefully consider the discriminators in the question. Take a moment to think divergently and to ensure that you address all parts of the question. We spent time talking about appealing to the audience, and that's about knowing your audience, meeting them where they are, moving them to your position, choosing your appeals from logos, pathos, ethos, and kairos, and that it's okay to pivot from one appeal to another. Lastly, we talked about interpretive writing, which is writing that tells the reader how you've evolved in your thinking about a topic, and which uses the same devices as persuasive and even narrative texts. So let's revisit our learning intentions. I hope now you are able to better identify the features of persuasive and interpretive texts and to better be able to craft language for the purposes of these texts. Now let me wish you luck in your exams this November and I hope that this video has given you some assistance.